Well, welcome everyone uh, to the Ideas Festival and this session, On Your Toes, Is There a Different Approach to Ageing? Uh, uh, first of all, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we gather today. Um, and I'll introduce myself, I'll play facilitator today. Uh, my name is Jan Irvine and I work in the Dance and Music Unit at Arts Queensland. And our presenters today are Beverly Giles and Glenn Murray. Um, uh, I first met Glenn uh, when he just came to visit me at Arts Queensland and I was very inspired by the work he was telling me about with his mature artist's dance experience in Canberra. He has a, an extensive performing background in dance, having worked with Australian Dance Theatre, Sydney Dance Company and the Australian Ballet. And um, fortunately he put me in touch with Beverly, uh, who is an independent consultant and working with um, uh, people and ageing, let me get it right, with and dementia care. And a very inspiring person, so I thought it was a, a very obvious um, gathering of minds to put these for these two people to, to join together to talk about the um, the possibilities behind physical activity artistic pursuits um, and, and and well-being and happiness uh, so I was very excited to to meet these two inspiring people and it, and it being an ideas festival I'm hoping that the next step after the idea is the action and I think these two people are absolutely the right people to put things in place um, and I'll let you tell their let you hear their story from their own mouths. And so I'll hand over, and I believe, Beverly, you're going to go first. Mm -hmm. And this session is being recorded, I believe, and I know that um, there is a roving mic, and if uh, 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 both Beverly and Glenn would like this to be quite an interactive session and uh, allow you the opportunities to ask questions or make contributions. So please wait until you have a microphone uh, to facilitate the recording of this session. Uh, so thank you. Without further ado, Beverly. Thank you, Jan. It's um, a real. I'm just avoiding that light. It's a real pleasure. Sorry, Is that right? Oh well, <laughs> that has its advantages. Actually, I'd rather be heard and not seen. But there you go. Um, well, it is in the light, isn't it? Um, <clears throat> Glenn and I met. <coughs> pardon me. Glenn and I met at the first. Um, conference in Australia for arts, health and well-being, where the goal was to bring together health practitioners and arts practitioners. And Glenn presented a session there. I was inspired by what he had to say. And I asked him afterwards if he would come to where I live, which is on North Stradbroke Island, and do a workshop. And to my great pleasure, Glenn said yes. He had an idea of his island, Tasmania, and my island, Stradbroke. And he came to the island, he did a workshop. He's coming again on the 4th of July, 4th of June, sorry, 4th of June, and doing another workshop on, on Stradi, and we're really looking forward to that. So um, this presentation is where Glenn and I hope to show you what it is we have in common and how we have been able to help each other. Um, for me to have a greater idea of what's involved um, in the actual practice of the arts and for Glenn to learn about my passion, which is how the brain works and what we can do to take control of our lives and look at ageing in a positive way because there are so many negative stereotypes about ageing and if you latch onto those, then it's all downhill. If you see the second half of life as the opportunity for you to do what you have always wanted to do. If you see that part of life as the time when you're going to be able to get involved in things like, in my case, the arts. I mean, I wanted to do ballet when I was a very small child, but I lived in a small country town. It wasn't available. So I've always been a, a follower as far as attending ballet and so on. I've never had the chance, never thought I would, couldn't believe what Glenn made it possible for me to do. So he'll uh, be talking to you about how he's done that for a lot of people like me in the second half of their lives. And I hope I'll be able to say to you, take a stand as far as ageing's concerned. Tell your brain that you're not going to go gently into that 
last good night. You're going to rage against it and you're going to do all sorts of things. So I've been talking about what you need to do as far as the brain's concerned. And then Glenn is going to tell you what he is actually doing so that the group of people that he works with are doing this now and he's seeing some wonderful results. So um, we'll um, move start. on. We'll yeah. start. <laughs> okay. Um, on your toes, um, is there a different approach to ageing? And there is a different approach to ageing. And Glenn's going to give us an example of how you can dance your way to better mental, social, psychological, physical health. Um, and there are other ways that we can get involved in the arts that will also lead to those sorts of outcomes. Um, now we see whether our, our little gadgets work, and this one apparently isn't going to, so... Um, We've been having the odd problem with, uh, with, uh, with equipment, um, which won't be any, any surprise to a lot of you. This fellow is Dr. Gene Cohen, and he was a, a, a trailblazer in the United States and subsequently in the world, really. In 1975, he was appointed director of a brand new institute for mental health and ageing. Well, they started to sort of resist the passive idea that ageing is all about problems and start seeing ageing in a completely different light. And that has gone from strength to strength. And this man, who unfortunately died just before the 2009 conference, however, it had inspired a lot of the people who spoke there and a lot of those of us who listened with the work that he's done. Um, this... Thanks, Glenn. He has, he's the author of two books that have, um, and a lot of other articles and, and so on, but these two books, particularly the first one, Creative Age, Awakening the Human Potential in the Second Half of Life, this inspired one of the powerful policy makers in Washington, D.C., and got involvement from government. So there was this sort of liaison like where we have today, Jan from government, you know, me from education and research and Glenn involved in practice and hopefully soon in a research project so he can get the, the evidence for what he's achieving. The other book, The Mature Mind, The Positive Power of the Ageing Brain, this is saying to us, this idea that with um, ageing comes a brain going downhill is wrong. It's not what happens at all. What happens is that there are certain losses, but there are a lot of things you can do about that. You don't just accept that these things are going to happen and go gently into that decline. You sort of look at what, in fact, you can achieve when your brain gets to a certain stage. And one of the things that I'll be talking about is a better communication between hemispheres. When a person is younger, the left hemisphere, for most people, is the part of the brain that they use the most. And it's not that the right hemisphere isn't available, but the communication between them and the way in which they're used isn't nearly as well integrated as it is in the second half of life. So in the second half of life, there is a greater ability in the brain to use both sides of the brain simultaneously and in the process, of course, to um, boost creativity and emotional intelligence. So that's a plus for ageing. What we know about what goes wrong, we can also do something about, and I'll be talking about that as well. The other was the um, 2001 and two, 2005 Creativity and Ageing study that Jean Cohen was such a, um, a major facilitator of. And this was a multi-site study. And it's, has, it was the first of its kind but Glenn will also be telling you about one that's happened in the UK and very similar results that have happened in both of these studies and all of them very encouraging. So that's just the book. The first one, I think sometimes if you see it, um, it helps you to, to know what you're looking for when you go looking. Um, 
this, the mature mind, the positive power of the ageing brain, this is what we're talking about when you see the brain, the ageing brain is a positive thing. And this is a study that I was talking about. <clears throat> it was um, measuring the impact of, of community-based studies on the general health, mental health and social activities of older people. Um, it's been three years duration, twofold goal. They were looking to change the way that older people think about ageing because one of the things that is very important, your brain responds to what you think and what you say. If you think it's all downhill, if you think that it's all about problems, then that's how it's going to be. But if you take a positive attitude, and this is where the arts and creativity in general, the creation of new things, is helping people to be able to take a more positive view and to achieve more than they ever imagined that they would. The other thing is the way older people are treated. Um, we are a youth and sports orientated society in many ways, particularly in the media, and older people are often patronised. Um, there's this attitude that, oh, well, after all, you know, they're past it and we'll just sort of um, look after them and they'll be fine. And activities that people are involved in, sometimes there's a patronising attitude to those sorts of things. Um, and we can change that by the way we present ourselves. If you think of yourself as somebody who is coming to the end of your life and it's all going to get harder and it's all going to get difficult. You're bored with yourself, so everybody else is obviously going to be bored with you too. It's, um, you know, nobody wants to hear about anybody else's problems. They've got enough of their own. But if somebody says, aha, this happened and I did this and I achieved that, aha, then we think, what's in it for me? Maybe with this <coughs> happening to me, I can do something about it too. He made the... There were two indicators that were really important that were measured, the sense of mastery and control, learning something new and the ripple effect, leading to increased confidence to try other things. And this is something that Glenn has very definitely experienced with the women involved in his program in, uh, in Tasmania. And you might like to uh, comment on that here, Glenn, would you? Sure, sure. Um, when when uh, there's a study that's come out of the UK that is showing that dance um, is a form of exercise that engages people more than any other form of exercise for a number of reasons. Not only does it do that, but it actually leads those people to other discoveries. And with the group I'm working with in Hobart, I've seen them, they've come in, and then they become interested in other things. And, and later you'll see the type of uh, work that we do. And through that, they're making discoveries, they're becoming inquiring, uh, they're undertaking research, they're investigating other kinds of activities. So it, it, it's, it's a beginning point, it's not an end. As um, Beverly's saying, it just continues to flow on. <laughs> I don't know what that is. I hope I've got to turn mine off so it's not my sound. Fortunately, hopefully it won't ring. Social engagement. We are by nature social beings and we need a social context for what we do. And this is where um, it's very obvious to me when Glenn talks about the program in Hobart and when he talks about the various things that he's been doing in the time that he's been working with the women engaged in that program, there's, there is a, a definitely a social context. There are definite relationships that are built, and these relationships are vitally important. People need these kinds of connections to try new things, to enjoy what they're doing, to talk about what they're doing, and then do other things together. So it has a tremendous benefit as far as widening the social circle that people have, widening the relationships they have, and all of these things are extraordinarily good for the brain. The two questions were asked, did you make new friends? Did you learn something new? Now, Glenn, you might like to comment on, on how that applies with MADE. What I'm seeing in MADE um, is that it's actually forming a society of its own, and it is a, a society based on support. Um, I'm working with a demographic uh, mature-aged women, so we have an entry level of age 50 upwards, so most of the women are mid-50s, mid-60s, 
Um, the independent, the, the uh, experiences changing, the exiting the workforce, the um, having long-term relationships break down, the having children leave home. So they're in a state of flux. And what this project, this creative project, is offering those women, it offers them a support network. And, and I see the relationship building. And, and if someone is ill, I see the mechanisms of care go into place. And, and if someone is distressed, for whatever reasons, I see all those sort of mechanisms. So we have a, a project which is based on an artistic ideal, but it's fulfilling these very beautiful, essential, um, these uh, you know, other uh, needs that are experienced by these people. And the, the, the criteria um, that were established for measuring these projects and for the successful projects were very much about they needed to be conducted by a professional artist. And Glenn, of course, was at the very top of his profession and he's maintained that. Um, sometimes I think things happen and there's a, a sort of attitude, and that'll do attitude. Um, that's so far from what I've seen as far as MAID's concerned. Um, it's all happening at a high level. Um, and that's possible because of Glenn's, um, not only because of his experience and ability, but also because of his attitude, his really deep and abiding respect for the people involved in his program. And that's something that has come across to me very strongly from the beginning. And it's meant a great deal to see somebody having such high ideals for people in this stage of their lives and with the participants that are involved. Um, the program needs to be evaluated and there's an ongoing element of evaluation in May. And the program has to be sustained for three years. Well, Glenn's program started in 2005, so we are now in the sixth year and it's gone from strength to strength. And I think um, Janice was sharing some ideas that she's, she's evolving at the moment about how much higher it can go and how much more and how much wider um, it can be spread. Um, the studies that uh, Jean Cohen did with 3,000 older um, adults identified <coughs> four distinct phases, and I'm sort of going to concentrate on two of them. Midlife re-evaluation. Now, this is in contrast to a lot of people who talk about midlife crisis and an expectation that when a person gets to midlife is going to be a crisis time. In his work, um, Jean Cohen found that only 10% of people talked about having a crisis in their lives. Many more of them looked at it being a time when they were involved in a quest, motivated by the desire to break new ground. And this is something that begins in the early 40s, goes through into the mid-50s when the liberation phase, which sometimes overlaps, this is a time to be innovative, a time to accept and look for challenges and to free oneself from previous inhibitions. For example, um, this is the effect MAID has already had on me. I never would have imagined in my wildest dreams, nor would anybody who has known me through the whole of my life have imagined me prancing round in a hotel lobby on Friday afternoon for the purposes, with a colleague of mine and with Glenn, for the purposes of getting a message out there into the community through the newspaper. And they insisted a photograph had to happen. And so we went along with it. But nowhere could I have imagined before meeting this fellow that I would ever <laughs> do that. And I'm sure none of my children are going to believe it. So, <laughs> Glenn. It's... I, th I think what um, Beverly is saying, the liberation, I mean, you know, we all have a different understanding of what that word may mean, but to see, and I'm talking from the point of view of, of women, because that's how my project in Hobart has evolved, but to see women who are at a time in their lives when they are generally told to sort of be quiet, you know, for so all intents and purposes disappear, to see these people liberated, to be completely free and open and exploring their potential is just a beautiful thing. It's so beautiful to give people permission to be how they want. And, and most of my work in this project is I'm saying, you don't have to do this. You don't have to you know, 
be what society kind of is trying to force you into being. It's just about being open and exploring. And, you know, it's glorious. I'm, I'm sure you've all probably seen it in, in, in certain ways. Um, and we'll see some images later. It's, it's just glorious. We'll be getting on to those soon. We'll just move on. We're um, doing the dry bit now. Yeah, we are. <laughs> <laughs> because it's important for the understanding. If I can just say, when I met Beverly and, and through my relationship with Beverly, Beverly is actually teaching me what it is I'm doing. I, I knew what I was doing from an artistic and creative and from a vision idea, but Beverly is giving me the, the background, the understanding, the information, the vocabulary, the articulation to actually be able to, to completely understand and, and share what we're doing. That's Thank you. Think. Thanks, Glenn. <laughs> and it's good to know it's more dry stuff now. <laughs> Yes, now we're getting two connections, this neuroscience, the, the new connections. This has been um, a very exciting time and the 21st century is very exciting for me in that the, the brain is the most fascinating of organs and there's many things that over the, the years that I've worked in this, this particular area, um, I've known certain things intuitively about the brain. And now to see neuroscience prove those things, I've always believed, use it or lose it, move it or lose it. I've always believed those things, but now <clears throat> we have the science to prove them. And so that people who may have need that sort of proof, it's there now. We can, we can see what's happening through the neuroimaging techniques using things like functional MRIs and PET scans and MEGs we can see what's actually happening in the brain when somebody's doing something. And we've had some interesting relationships grow between different groups. For example, between the Dalai Lama and his people who are highly advanced in meditation, where they are asked to do certain things with their brain to feel certain feelings and the scientists take the pictures and we gain the knowledge. Um, another dry one. We can change our brain. This is a sort of the image of a neuron and the connections that it makes and the various things that happen at the synapse. And this synapse and increasing synapses is, is what we're talking about when we talk about neuroplasticity. So we're talking about neuroplasticity now where the brain, um, neurons in the brain, brain cells grow new connections. And they're only going to new, do that if those connections are needed. If you're going to sit around watching sort of the box or sitting at the computer or doing lots of the things that people do that are sedentary and not involving them in any significant way, then those connections that you can see there, they're going to shrivel. It's like a rust in the brain. They shrivel and they die and the brain shrinks. Now, what we want is a nice, plump, healthy... You might want a slim body, but you want a nice, plump, healthy brain full of lots of connections. And the next one, which is the fact that we can, in fact, grow new brain cells. Now, this has been the most exciting part of science because this shows us that things that we previously talked about, like normal ageing forgetfulness, it was normal because the hippocampus, which has a key role in memory, particularly when we're talking recent memory and working memory and processing things that come into the brain again and again and again before they can be sent off to long-term um, long storage. This happens in the hippocampus. And this is an, an organ shaped like a seahorse that's deep within the limbic system and has this key role. We now know that through aerobic exercise, and I can tell you from experience, and Tara, my friend and colleague in, in the group there, will be able to support this, that when you get moving with Glenn, it soon becomes aerobic. And it does certainly have that, that side of creativity, that side of, of um, art, but it has it in an aerobic sense too, so that we're getting benefits from every direction. Mm -hmm. So this is what I was talking about 
as a, a consequence, as one of the things, not a consequence, as, as one of the joys of ageing, when there's a better communication between... I know that I was very much a left brain sort of person as far as, as the things that I was involved in, the things that I was interested in, very much words were my thing. Um, but now um, I'm that sort of conference, the Arts, Health and Wellbeing Conference in Port Macquarie in 2009 was a sort of epiphany for me and just expanded the interest and overlapped the interests of what I have previously done now that I, I'm desperately trying to get people in my field to get involved in offering the people in their care opportunities to be creative and particularly to be involved in dance in a whole variety of forms because that is something not only can it reduce your risk of dementia, reduce your risk of your brain going downhill, but when somebody does have dementia, we can see real improvement and real re-engagement with life from people who had become sedentary and passive and not involved, sort of sitting thus, who through the work of a community artist who came in voluntarily and gave some time, they got involved with a whole variety of different media and people came alive again, literally. And I am talking about people who were cutting off from the world with dementia, who re-engaged with the world through art. It's those of you who are artists, whenever you can offer your art, whatever kind of art it is, whether it's your dance, whether it's, it's sort of um, you can sort of draw or anything, folk art, any talents you have that you can offer in a facility where people with dementia are receiving care, whether it's residential or community, an hour a week would change lives and you would get so much tremendous feedback from it. Um, there's another colleague of mine sitting here too who has got the people in her aged care facility up in Charters Towers involved in cats. Now, how's that? That's her there. She's, Glenn is going to really want to talk to, to Mary Ann, I'm sure. Um, so this communication between hemispheres is important. Better move on, Glenn. Neuroplasticity, thousands of potential connections. This is what we're talking about. Talk about the brain making extra connections because it needs to, because we're asking it to. Um, this is John Rayty. He's written a book called Spark, and I highly recommend that book to you because he talks about exercise and primarily how exercise can help in a whole lot of different ways. But the ones that I'm going to be thinking about today, um, dance is at the very top of the tree. Gene Cohen picked that up quite early. John um, Rayty has certainly got lots of evidence to support that, and it's generally accepted. Um, the Alzheimer's Australia has just held their conference in Brisbane, and they are recognising, and speakers at that conference were recognising the fact that dance is at the very top of the tree because it's physical, physical, intellectual, and it involves social engagement. They're the three things the scientists identify as essential to a healthy brain. And then when you add, as May does, creativity, you get an extra boost to what is already a very strong mixture. So um, this is the book. Thanks, Glenn. He... Um, Talks, John Rayty, John Rayty's website actually, johnrayty.com, is a very inspiring place to go to. There's a YouTube on there about um, some of the work he's doing that I'm sure you'll find really inspiring. Um, exercise causes the brain to produce substances that nourish neurons, encouraging them to make connections. And this is the neuroplasticity I was talking about. Regular exercise calms the body, reduces stress, optimises learning and bays the hipp hippocampus in nerve growth factor. Now, this is something that um, uh, John Rady calls miracle grow for the brain. 
and it switches on the prefrontal cortex, which is, is pictured on the next slide. So this prefrontal cortex is very important and it's not going to be switched on properly unless people are really engaged and involved and doing things. It produces some substances that are very important that you may have heard of, serotonin. This reduces anxiety. This is the, the feel-good um, substance, the neurotransmitter that makes people feel good. It's also important as far as, as resisting things that can happen, particularly if with ageing comes social isolation, as it so often does. People tend to more and more... Um, lock themselves in their, in their houses if they're, they're suffering from anxiety disorders or depression or compulsive obsessive or all of these are reduced by involvement in exercise. Dopamine, the learning, reward, satisfaction, attention and movement transmitter. Now this substance, um, you get it through exercise and it's a lot cheaper than getting it through shopping. Um, nor epinephrine, there's a lot of men in the audience looking relieved and one I know well. Nor release increases alertness, concentration and energy. So these substances are produced when people engage in aerobic exercise. Um, during exercise, specific proteins push through the blood-brain barrier. Now, the blood-brain barrier is there to protect the brain from harmful bacteria and from substances that will do it harm. These substances can get through. Um, they are listed there, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which I've already mentioned as miracle grow for the brain. Um, you've got IGF-1, which is, is um, a substance that enables insulin to do its job better, so glucose, which provides energy, gets to the cells better. BEGF, that is in the brain for um, growing more capillaries, and then the final one, FGF, that is for healthier inside to your capillaries and also making brain cells grow. As Glenn said, it's dry. The amygdala is the part of the brain that has a major role in um, emotions. So you start recording sensory and emotional experiences in your brain before you're even born. They continue to be um, important throughout your life as far as when people get older and some parts of their brain, as far as the neocortex are concerned, may not be working with quite the same speed as they did when they were younger, then parts of the brain like the amygdala draw on the senses to boost what the brain does better. And the hippocampus, which I've already mentioned. Now, this is, is um, something that, that Gene Cohen said and it was supported by his colleague, Susan Perlstein, who spoke at the conference Glenn and I were at. And I think this is a thing about ageing. This is really what I was thinking when we were sort of moving in that hotel foyer um, because the photographer from the newspaper and, and, and the journalist had to have a movement um, sort of photograph, which once would have scared me into the toilet for the rest of the, for the duration <laughs> until they'd left. But on this occasion, I really did think, what can they do to me, the people in this hotel foyer? I might, you know, they might see that I'm doing something odd. Um, as far as what you do in hotel foyers, well, what I've always done in hotel foyers, um, but what can they do to me? And it was a freeing thing. What we did actually have was about maybe half a dozen or so children who were in the foyer do doing it with us. You know, they were participating, so... Helped. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then if not me, who? And if not now, when? And that's the thing. You think, well, if I... These things that I've been putting off, I'm thinking one day I'm going to do this. If I don't do them now, when am I going to do them? And then we get to the final part of the brain, um, and that is the cerebellum. And by getting the cerebellum very much involved, which movement does, you're going to reduce the risk of falls, and falls are events in an older person's life that can utterly change that life. A fractured hip can really send a person on a downward spiral. So being able to get people involved in things 
that's going to reduce that risk, and this is one thing I'm very aware of as far as MAID is concerned, and Glenn, I'll hand over to Glenn now um, to comment on that and then move on to his um, PowerPoints. So I'll change, change mm, places thanks. with you, Glenn. Press the button. Oh, thanks. Um, a lot of what I'm going to sort of talk about now just reinforces, I think, um, what Beverly has said. But as I said, it's my relationship with Beverly that has led me to understand a, a lot of what is going on. I founded MAID in 2005 uh, in Hobart, that's where I live. Um, when I turned 40, I became invisible and I suddenly saw all the other invisible people. And I became very interested in that experience. Um, so I, I, as, as a former dancer, I wanted to use my vocabulary and my experience and my aesthetic to investigate what it is to be an older person, a, an adult in our society. Uh, this one, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Um, globally, we're an ageing population, there's no doubt about that, but uh, many of the cultural activities in this country in particular, I'm talking about Australia, seem to exclude older members of the community from active participation. Next one. Um, our, our cultural obsession with the youthful ideal has the potential to negate the valuable contribution older adults make to our cultural identity. And this contribution is through their talent, the application of their talent, skills and experience. Um, MADE was founded in 2005 to, to provide mature adults with dance and theatre skills development opportunities provide them with highly aesthetic performance outcomes in non-traditional performance venues and to offer audiences um, an alternative view of contemporary dance. We run uh, quite an extensive training program in Hobart. We offer um, movement classes, which is sort of a fusion of classical contemporary techniques, because that's my own history. Um, it it's been a process of evolution and, it and it's working for us in Hobart. We supplement that training with other uh, skill sets that are needed for the productions that we're working on. We have theatre skills, we have vocal training, we have um, fibre weaving we've done recently, and you'll see why a bit later. And a very, part, a very important part of, of our project in Hobart is the performance um, project. Um, a, a lot of the, the women who are attracted, and, and I keep saying women because in Hobart it is just women, no men have come forward, um, we're developing a brand based on that fact that it is women, and there's something very beautiful about these older women in a performance context that I'm really working to protect um, because there's it's just something so glorious about it. Um, health and well-being benefits of dance. Um, that's good one. Sorry, not what it is. Sorry. You will come next one. Yeah. Um, the the benefits have not really been evaluated in this country, um, the, but the success of made and we are successful. Our profile is growing. Our support base is growing, um, and the number of like-minded groups emerging around the country. I was in Ad, uh, Canberra just recently to see a new groups starting there. I had a visit from a lady from Adelaide who wants to start a group there. So there's a, there's a really kind of bubbling energy of, of people who have heard about or come themselves to a discovery that this is what they want. They want to be creatively engaged at this time in their life. Uh, to me, it's about claiming space. You know, I mean, these women, you know, they love this image. We, we did a little uh, piece with paper bags on the head. They think it's funny, you know, but it says a, it sends a very uh, clear message at the time. So, you know, all, all this stuff um, will uh, offer opportunity for evaluation in this country. It's on its way. It's going to happen. Um, I just love this image, and I'll just briefly talk about it before we push on. It's just so caring. Can you see the care in that image? Um, and in the paper yesterday here, it was talking about how important touch is as human beings. We need to be touched. Um, and this is the kind of, these are the kind of relationships that are building through this project. Relationships based on, on respect, care, and a, and a shared passion to be something that they felt they weren't allowed to be, but they just want to do that now. So, yeah, it's not one. 
most of the current um, uh, uh, studies are coming out of the UK and the US. Um, Beverly focused on the US, so I'll focus on the UK. And this is because those countries have a shared and a, a longer history of engaging older members of their community in, in cultural activities. Yeah, next one. Kulfax Hot Feet is the, the study that we'll sort of flip through because it does re, uh, it just kind of reinforces a lot of what Beverly sort of talked about. Um, it was uh, commissioned by the UK, um, yeah, next one. It was commissioned by the uh, United Kingdom Department of Health. So this report states that dance can yeah, it's another one, increase people's motivation, as I said before, to participate in uh, physical activity, but it maintains that participation because it's fun, expressive, non-competitive, and it's social. Um, dance can increase people's physical fitness, strength, and abilities. And I've witnessed this. I, I think, you know, what I'm... I'm I'm living these facts, you know, Beverly has the facts, but I and the women in Hobart, we are living these facts. Um, two, two examples, uh, several physiotherapists are working in the project. One had a small injury, she went to see a physiotherapist, she's 60 something, she won't tell me. And, um, <laughs> and, and the, the physio said to her, what are you doing? Your muscles are so strong. And she said, oh, I do dance, you know. And another had a stent, uh, is that bypass or something in her heart? one of the vessels in the heart, yeah. which is just a, large, a yeah. picture. She was in there to hold it open. Yeah. She was in, she had the surgery, and the, the, the hospital staff were really impressed with her kind of recovery and, and stuff, and they said, and she said, yes, I have to get back to dancing, you know. So, you know, we are living these facts. You know, dance can uh, you know, assist recovery from illness, reduce pain, and quite interestingly, the perception of pain, and Beverly and I were talking yesterday, and, um, very important because when in the perception of pain the, the, a person there are many stories in, in the literature that I've read of people who had were experiencing pain and the involvement in dance with the music and with the movement and with the whole aesthetic that's involved in dance they were able to put aside their sort of feelings of that this is too painful and, and to participate and with participation came a lower, much lower threshold of pain. And I have in fact in one of when I was doing some work in a in a, a nursing home at one stage, a lady came to the door that it was in the, the training room was in the middle of a facility and this lady came to the door and she said, looking through the glass. And so I invited her in is something I often do. And she participated in what we were doing. One of the things that, that we were doing was a little um, example of dance that I sort of try to get people involved in doing these things and then I say to them, well, why not? You know, why can't you do this? Why can't you do this where you are with the people instead of letting them sit there? But this particular lady had a walker and when she came thus, once the dance started, one stage I said, oh, well, this might be a bit difficult. She said, no, no, she was 83. <laughs> and, she was, and that's what being sick. It, it, I think it's just having the opportunity, you know. It, it's having the opportunity and it's having the, the support guide. or the encouragement. Hmm? Having the guide. Just having permission, you know, a lot of the women in Hobart, I just give them permission. I, I really don't do much more, you know. I, I just create an environment and give them permission. This is, you know, we just glossed over that. Um, yeah, just another one. And <laughs> uh, just walked her quickly from here, yeah. I, I think this is interesting, you know. Um, dance has been shown to enable people to achieve more. But in older adults, it, they've transcended their physical, intellectual, and emotional limitations. And I've seen that. I've, I've seen these people, they've come in, and over a course of time, and it's not an easy fix, we've been working six years and we, you know, do, you know, blah, 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 blah. Um, but they are just proud of what they've achieved and it's beyond what they could have imagined. And, you know, it's just, it's exciting. It's really, really exciting. One of the things that Glenn was talking to me about too is that it's beyond what their families and friends and peer groups expected. 
and their perception has changed greatly over the period that they've been doing this. Just yeah. something you want to say? Yes, I think I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Let me get to the... Um, in, the, in the beginning of May, um, a lot of the participants actually had to fight a number of demons to participate. And, and a lot of that was their families and partners saying, don't make a fool of yourself, don't be stupid, stay home, get my dinner ready, what are you doing, mum, you know, all this sort of stuff. Each of them has had to battle certain situations. Um, they've come to the project because they have their own needs. Um, and and the, the lady who visited from Adelaide recently, she said to me, she said, these people are amazing, you know, like she was inspired by these people who, who invested and, and went and participated and were there in the middle of that space, you know, it was great. I think the one thing I would just like to say is that dance has been shown to contribute to quality of life. People feel better, more active, enthusiastic, inspired, excited, alert, attentive, less irritable, distressed, and nervous. How else would you rather be? You know, <laughs> like, it's quite simple, isn't it, you know? No, yes or no? Just like it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. What I'm, what I'm trying to say here is, you know, and this is a question for myself, you know, is made a one-way experience? And in the beginning it was. It was me who was, I was 40 then. I had just exited my own professional career. Um, I was teaching, 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 and these people were sort of, you know, coming to class and sort of things like that. But then I meet Beverly and, and, and I start to understand what is sort of happening. And, um, and this project is, is flying both ways. You know, these people, they give up their time, they come, we meet in the studio, um, they're getting better, so I have to look at my own personal development to stay one step ahead of them. Um, I'm experiencing opportunities. I get to be here today and, and you know, talk to you. And, and um, we, uh, all of the other professional artists that come in and work with the group in Hobart are excited and learn from them. You know, it, it's, it's a two-way kind of revolution. It's a revolution. It's a revolution. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and that's just reinforcing that it is a two-way exchange. You know, um, I, I said to Janice earlier today, this project is the first time in my own life, my personal sad existence, that I've actually given. I, I, I give, but I'm giving, but I'm getting so much back. These people give back to me. It's this beautiful, fluid kind of universal. You know, you you plant a little seed and it just flowers and, and bears fruit. And, it, you know, it's just, it's a healthy situation. You just feel all your internal organs and things behaving and, and feeling good. It's just, it's healthy. So. It's healthy too because all of these things, what they do in fact is boost the body's immune system. So getting involved in this has that physiological effect as well. It reduces stress and, and boosts the body's immune system and its ability to fight various things that can happen with ageing. So cancer and disease. This, um, I, I probably should introduce some of these slides. You know, this, uh, these are obviously images from the project in Hobart. And, um, you know, these women have not done anything like this before. They, um, you know, one works in the health department, another school teacher, several retired physiotherapists, um, you know, people doing this, doing that. These are ordinary people just being extraordinary, just completely extraordinary. But in the beginning, there was confusion. The funding agencies said to me, Glenn, mm, that's health that you're doing. We can't help you here. And then the health agencies were saying, mm, that's a bit arty, you know, we can't sort of help you. So, <laughs> you know, th there's been a conundrum. But, um, but highly aesthetic is really important to me. You know, it, it frames these people. It respects them. It validates their investment, and they do invest. One lady drives an hour each way, three times a week. An hour driving in Hobart is enormous. It's like you need a passport, you know. <laughs> ten, ten minutes in Hobart is, oh, I don't know, it's a bit far. You know, she drives an hour. Um, it, so they invest, and so it needs to be, uh, I need to create very beautiful environments to put these people in. This, just briefly, is a project we're working on this year called BIRDS. Um, that image on the left is the promotional image, and these are details of nests. A fibre artist is making nests two metres across that the women will be situated in. They will inhabit those nests as part of this performance installation. So we work very closely with 
and it's important to the women that that it, th it's very important to the women that I had a career at such a high level, and it's important that I bring in other high level artists to work with them. It makes them proud, and uh, it, it that and part of that pride is part of boosting their self esteem and their confidence. And it, you know, it might sound small, but it's actually a very sort of important thing. And um, and you know, and then you know, and is it health? And I think you can look at health in many ways. You know, I mean, I was thinking the other day. I get a great deal of joy from this project, and I suddenly realised how small a word joy is. And then I started to think about how big the impact and 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 the benefits and and uh, you know the excitement and and all those other sort of adjectives that come as part of that tiny word joy. Um, and then talking about health in another way, this is a, a project that's happening um, in Tasmania. It's a, it's a two-year community dance project. It's a pilot project. We're very fortunate that Tasmania was chosen to, to deliver this project. Um, MADE is part of that project in, in the south of the state. And uh, what we're doing is working with... Uh, we were approached by voluntary hospice workers who identified us as a means of... Uh, uh, opening dialogue with the community about issues which are very important to them, death and the process of dying and, and people's having control over their own death and you know all this sort of stuff and how it's so hidden in our society and it's taboo and we're frightened and, and when you're confronted with death uh, or, the, or an illness, we don't know how to act. So already in Hobart, people are talking about this and I'm really actually surprised at the the positive reaction to, to this project. We launched it uh, last week or so, and, and I was a bit mm, not sure. The response has is, is already been fantastic, and uh, one of the key workers in the hospice said, Glenn, we've already achieved what we want to achieve. We haven't even started the project, but you know, she said, people are talking about death, you know, and um, you know, it's beautiful. You know, that an, that an arts organization, peopled by ordinary people, can have such effect and, and can, can contribute to the experience of people. It just, it's, it's beautiful, glorious. Is that taboo of speaking about death means that a lot of people suffer a very lonely death? Which um, is awful. People won't talk about it now. Here we go. It's, um, what we're looking at and through very committed people like uh, Beverly and, and Tara, who's here today, um, because uh, both of these people and, and some others here in Queensland have experienced what you might call the maid way, you know. Um, they invited me up and with a colleague of mine, Wendy, who's here today, we ran an um, uh, initial workshop on the island and, and out, out of that, that first-hand experience has come a very committed core who want to see maid established um, in Queensland. So to that end, we're running a, another workshop on Stradi on the 4th of June. Um, and there's some information here and through Beverly's website as well. We just kind of have to sort of, you know, running a little bit out of time. So I just would like to say some thank yous because it's very important to say thank you. I'd really like to thank you for coming today because you're here and, and then you tell people and the word gets out and, um, and then you might contact me with advice or support or something, you know. Um, certainly I'd like to thank Arts Queensland, particularly Janice Irvine, it's because of Janice that we are here today. Janice believes in, in this project. Um, and Made in Queensland, Beverly, Mariana and Shona and Tara. And, um, and the Maidens, um, it's, it's, you know, it's because of them that, that I'm happy and joyous and excited and have so much to look forward to. And, um, what else can I say? Thank you. So, do we do questions or something? Or? <laughs> 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 <laughs>